IPv4 and IPv6. A debate that is lively in many technical forums and meetings. There are the believers of IPv6 and there are the believers of uh, IPv4. And both argue in the meetings uh, with pros and cons. Uh, they throw up arguments on the table that really are no arguments. Um, and I'm trying to uh, explain in this video what those myths are and what is true and what is not true because a lot of the arguments that are being used are just fake just based on nonsense uh, or really not understanding uh, what those uh, protocols are doing um, the debate is not only living amongst managers or engineers or architects it, it lives along the whole broad range of IT people uh, so um, a lot of us believe that IPv6 will never happen. Well, the reality is IPv6 is with us already and before you even know it, it's on your laptop or your PC or whatever because it's de facto enabled unless you disable it. But now let me get on to the 10 most famous myths of IPv4 versus IPv6. So I'm gonna throw up a few myths here on the table. Uh, that will actually prove that a lot of this stuff what's been stated by so many is kind of nonsense. The first one uh, that I come often uh, across is that it's basically stated that it is not uh, ready for production IPv6. So your IPv4 believer would state, no, we don't want to go to an IPv6 network because it just isn't ready uh, for uh, production. Well, that is a very, very poor statement uh, because IPv6 has been around for many, many, many years. It was developed over more than 20 years ago. And in fact, uh, we had the IPv6 uh, World Day uh, in June 8 uh, in 2011. And since that day, it has even further developed. And in fact, all major vendors of PCs and hardware and, and, and Macs and so on, they all support in full IPv6. So using that statement as an argument not to go to IPv6 is a very, very poor statement. Another argument which is quite often used by the IPv4 believers is that IPv6 will break their network. Well, IPv6 is not going to break their network because IPv6 can operate over the same wire as IPv4. It's a different protocol. The two do not talk to each other directly and you can run both parallel to each other. That's what we call dual stack mode. And while your IPv4 network is far from optimum in terms of IP addressing and summarization, uh, you can continue using that, but you can at the same time overlay on that network a new IPv6 network with real officially registered IP space and you can actually construct it and architect it in such a nice way that it really is streamlined and organized. That is reality. So don't use the argument that it will break your network because IPv6 is not going to break your network. Of course, all your devices will have to be able to run dual stack. That is a given. Another popular statement is that it's too hard to use IPv6 addressing. It's funny. Uh, it is really funny because engineers are used to work with binary and hexadecimal, if I'm not mistaken. And at least in my engineering background, we were using hexadecimal notations. Well, guess what? IPv6 is hexadecimal, where an IP address in IPv4 is expressed in decimal. Now, an IPv4 address has actually 32 bits broken up in four chunks of eight bits, right? So from zero to 255 uh, for each chunk. Now an IPv6 address has 128 bits. So that's a lot, lot more. That actually means that you have 400 trillion times the amount of IP space uh, in IPv4. Now that is great. Uh, because now everybody can have official and unique IPv6 uh, IP space, uh, address space, which is not the case uh, for an IPv4 environment because there you just don't have enough IP addresses to give it to everybody. So saying that it's too hard to use, it's kind of weird. Uh, 
Of course, engineers will say, oh, but I do not want to ping an IP address which, which is 128 bits wide or, or in hexadecimal. Well, yeah, I can understand that, but IPv6 gives you truncated not, uh, addressing. So basically you can remove leading zeros and all that. So you can really shorten it in. Uh, furthermore, uh, with IPv6, you can actually uh, code the IP address really nicely. You can chop it up in pieces, uh, like you do subnetting, basically. You could use cities and, and, and regions and, and even maybe streets or departments in streets and whatever you have in an organization and code it with unique numbers because you've got plenty of bits to play with. And therefore, you can put a structure in your IPv6 addressing schema. Much, much simpler than on IPv4, believe me. And there's no need for address translation and all of that stuff that you have to do in IPv4. So therefore, uh, IPv6 is a lot easier to use, but you need to get used to it. It's like moving from a Windows PC to a Mac or from a Mac to a Windows PC. It takes a bit of time to get used to it. And so therefore, it is not hard to use at all, even in its raw form. But let's face it, a lot of the pinging work and, and addressing work shouldn't be done anymore on the IP level. We should use DNS. And both IPv4 and IPv6 have a DNS function. So I think that argument is very, very weak that it's too hard to be used. It is not. And then you have those that say, oh yeah, but IPv6, uh, if I deploy this, my users will kill me. Well, I don't know why the users would kill you, because first of all, they will never be confronted with an IPv6 address if that was too difficult for them, because they will be using DNS. And basically, uh, today, every PC operating system already has an IPv6 embedded in it. So really, uh, I don't know why that would be a problem or why users would hate you if you deploy IPv6. In fact, they might even like it. And both IPv6 and IPv4 do support TCP and UDP. So I cannot see what the issue could be there. Um, and you can actually have reachability between IPv4 and IPv6 uh, address spaces. Uh, of course, you will have to have some translation like NAT64 or something like that. But the essence is that it is not a problem. So I think that myth is also busted. So here goes the IPv4 guy again. Uh, IPv6 is not secure because it doesn't use NAT. And NAT is network address translation. Now, for all clarity, NATing is not a security feature. I mean, whoever says that NATing is a security feature he should read up what NATing is all about. It's like at home, you have one public IPv4 uh, network address, which is provided by your service provider to your ADSL modem. And then in your house, uh, you have a whole bunch of laptops and devices that are sitting on a private uh, IPv4 addressing range, and they are not seen by the internet because all their flows are translated uh, by the NATing function uh, of your uh, ADSL modem or router, basically. So nothing by itself doesn't do nothing for you. In a private company or an enterprise that are running their own that are running their own networks, uh, really you don't want to do nothing because you want to have full traceability of the IP packets from the source to their destination, and you don't want to have any hidden um, uh, PCs or anything like that uh, behind nothing. So really. Uh, it is really wrong to say that IPv6 is less secure uh, because it doesn't have netting. Uh, that's not true at all. Now, IPv6 indeed does not require netting because the IP addressing space is vast enough uh, compared to IPv4. So that myth is very well busted. All right, so I shouldn't be picking on the IPv4 guys all the time uh, because also the IPv6 guys have uh, some myths that are not true. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, IPv6 is inherently more secure because it's all IPsec. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, the initial protocols uh, that were developed uh, were actually uh, only IPsec and IPv6 was supposed to be only IPsec. But that standard has been revised since a long time ago and now IPv6 is in the clear just like IPv4. 
And both can use IPsec if you enable it and install it and set it up. And therefore, saying that IPv6 is inherently more secure than, than IPv4 just because it was initially based on IPsec is a false statement. You can't use that as an argument. The IPv4 guy will say, well, there is no rush uh, to move to IPv6. Well, the reality is there is a huge rush. It's probably already 5 after 12 for IPv6. Remember, the world has expanded. The Internet is expanding by the day. Think of the Internet of Things. Everything that you have in your house will have an IP address. Your car, um, your GSM, your tablet, um, your drill machine, your mixer, your washing machine, your dishwasher, you name it. Everything will have an IP address very soon. The Internet of Things, right? So therefore, we need lots of IP addresses. Uh, and if we don't get the amount of IP addresses, it ain't going to happen. And that's exactly why we need to have IPv6. Now, especially in the Asian region and in other areas of the world, um, the Internet is developing very fast and a massive amount of people. And they all require actually IP addresses. So therefore, we need IPv6. Now, a lot of uh, huge service providers, they bought all the IPv4 IP address space a long time ago and they hang on to it. Um, and maybe, and just maybe, they are holding back IPv6 uh, because they don't want any competitors on their markets. So that might be a means, but I don't think that's going to work. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, uh, there is a rush. Absolutely, it's more than time to move on uh, with IPv6 if we don't want to stall development. IPv6 guys will probably say, I need it right now. Um, and only IPv6. Well, I think that's a bit too short through the curve uh, because uh, a lot of infrastructure is still IPv4. A lot of uh, areas are IPv4. Uh, and I think personally that IPv4 will be around for a long time. Uh, especially in networks and infrastructure that do exist. Uh, that's not going to change overnight. Uh, something has to drive it to change. And therefore, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 will coexist for a long time. And slowly IPv6 will actually take over. Uh, by no means should we stop installing IPv6. Uh, that's the point I'm trying to make here. And both can coexist and that's what we call dual stack mode so we can run both uh, networks parallel so using the argument that we need ipv6 right now and only ipv6 uh, that is wrong as well uh, we need to have ipv6 immediately and as fast as possible in all the networks um, to make it more future proof but at the same time uh, we need to retain in many areas the legacy ipv4 infrastructures as well and we have to make sure that both can communicate or have reachability between them which is possible with uh, nat64 and other um, conversion methods between the two protocols by nature the two protocols do not communicate with each other so i think that myth is busted as well all right uh a lot of IPv4 folks will say that nobody is using it. Well, the reality is after the World IPv6 Day in, in the year 2011, uh, it became very popular and it's all around us. So the ones that say IPv6 is not in use, I think they're just sticking their head in the sand and are not willing to see reality. Uh, and it will continue. So I think that is also a very, very poor statement uh, to make. So some people will say, uh, well, I'm running an IPv4 network only with modern laptops and modern operating systems on it. And, and you know, you tell me it's all embedded in it, IPv6, but I am not using it. Uh, I'm not running it. Well, the reality is that it is running before you, before you even know it. Uh, in fact, any operating system that you get nowadays has a IPv6 in it and it's enabled de facto. So it will build... Uh, an IPv6 network for you, uh, even if you like it or not. Uh, so don't ignore it because it is there. And tunneling protocols like uh, Torito uh, actually um, will hook up your home laptop with the IPv6 internet, bypassing your netting and all this. So your PC is wide open to the internet. So if you have a firewall, 
your firewall is running nothing for you, then you would hope and you would think that you are protected. But no, you are not because your laptop in your home line uh, is going to set up an IPv6 network uh, without you knowing it unless you disable it and it will turn a little bit Dorito uh, over uh, your infrastructure back to the internet and your firewall and your netting will know nothing about it because those are things uh, that are only applicable for IPv4. So do not ignore it. It's there. So you might as well configure it properly and use it properly. So that myth is busted as well. <clears throat> Another one which is commonly used is the fact that IPv6 uh, is so much better in quality of service. Well, again, I'm very sorry, but it is not so much better. Yes, it has more bits to identify traffic flows and treatment, but IPv4 has it as well. Far less bits, if it's what we call the DSCP values. But to be very honest, on IPv6, not all the bits are used for QS and there are very few implementations of it. So basically, QoS works on both as good. Uh, there is no reason why we would say IPv6 is better than I, uh, IPv4 for QoS purposes. Because at the end of the day, it's all about queues and buffers and drop policies and how you mark the traffic. And I think, personally, they are both equal. Uh, a bit different, but they are equal. So I think that myth is busted as well. And the last thing I want to say is that a lot of people will state that, oh, well, in IPv6, uh, we cannot use multicast. No, you're right. Uh, multicast is not an IPv6 thingy. But you don't need multicast in IPv6. That's the beauty of it. So things are a lot simpler in IPv6. So therefore, uh, I think that myth is busted as well.